All right, hello everybody. Welcome back. Today we're going to start a new um, series of messages on the history of the church. This will be part one, and this will be about Jesus's disciples. And we'll be looking at Old Testament versus New Testament. So really, this is going to be kind of pre-church. <laughs> We're going to really be looking at the stuff that leads up to the church. But I want to explain to you what the church is. And I want to, well, let me just say this. I believe the Bible. Amen. And where the Bible says it, I'm not afraid to go there. But a lot of our brethren, uh, they are afraid to go there because a lot of times people go to an extreme. And uh, we have a line and a lot of times they're afraid of being over on this side, so they won't go to the line. They want to stay over here, so they won't talk about certain things. Well, I believe it's okay to go up to the line, just don't cross it. <laughs> so what we're going to do today, I'm going to talk about some stuff. We're going to go to the line. We're going to get as close as we can to where the other side is without going over to the other side. Does that make sense? Because the other side teaches some things that are off, and a lot of brethren are like, well, then we don't even talk about those things. So we allow them to censor our speech. Uh, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So I'm not afraid to go to the line, but I know my Bible too well to cross the line. Does that make sense? So here's another line. All right. We believe in dispensations. The, the correct teaching is to believe in dispensations. Well, there are a lot of people over here that say, no, there's no dispensations. They're on that side of the line. Well, I'm not going to cross the line and go over to them and say, there's no dispensations in the Bible. There are dispensations yeah. in the Bible. But then we have people that go to the opposite extreme. And these are your hypers. We, we call them hyper dispensationalists. And they cross the line. Yeah. So a lot of our brethren, though, they stay on this side, closer to these people on this side. Well, they, they're afraid to talk about what these people over here are talking about. And I, I'm not afraid of that, okay? So today we're going to look at that, and I'm going to rightly divide, amen, the word of truth. So we're going to talk about today the history of the church, part one. We're going to focus in on before the cross a little bit, and what took place before the cross that led up to the body of Christ as we know it today. The word in the Greek language for church is ekklesia. All right, that's Greek. Woohoo! I know Greek. Yay, whatever, you know. You don't need Greek, you need English. But a lot of people will, in this teaching, say, well, the word is, and then they focus in on what that word means. Which, by the way, I think it's interesting. If you speak Spanish, the word for church is iglesia. The Greek word is ekklesia, Spanish word iglesia. It's almost the same. A lot of our words have their root in Latin and Greek and those things like that. So it's kind of interesting. So ecclesia, or the word for church, is a called out assembly. That's what it means. A called out assembly. So we're going to look at, in the Bible, when it talks about the church. Because uh, there is a called out assembly even before the church. <laughs> What? Yeah, in the Bible, God called out a certain group of people before he called out over here, us. Right. And that was Israel. So this is what's interesting. Now, this is going to get us into mm, a little bit of debate in the minds of some people. All right, let's start with Hebrews chapter 9 today. And this is something that people like to argue about. Can I just say I don't like arguing? I don't want to start an argument today. So I'm going to go in with the Bible and go to what the Bible says. We're not going to start arguments, but we're going to look at the Bible. One of the things that I saw as an argument was this. When does the church start? You want to start a good argument? Ask that question in an independent Baptist church and see what happens. I told you that story years ago. There was a church and, and my dad said, go talk to that pastor. So I did. And he wouldn't give me the time of day. He just kept going, when does the church start? When did the church start? Like he wants to make contention. I said, well, will you teach me? He goes, no, no, you tell me. And he's just so argumentative. I don't believe in being argumentative. Amen. So let's ask that question, but then let's go to the Bible and answer it. So before we look at when did the church start, we have to look at something that's super important, and that's what I always like to focus in on, and that's the blood of Jesus. When Jesus shed his blood on the cross, that was a turning point. That was a very important thing to focus in on. Amen? When Jesus died and shed his blood. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 16, the Bible says this is what happened. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. So when Jesus died on the cross, that started the New Testament. And the Old Testament then is everything before Jesus dies. So it's 
a change that takes place when he died. Now, before Jesus died, it was all about Israel. After Jesus died, then it went to the church. But I believe the church starts with Jesus. Okay? It's called the body of Christ because it's all about Jesus Christ. So let's look at some more verses. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. A lot of people want to argue and say, well, I believe the church started this time. Or I think you have your mid-Axers. I think the church didn't start till the middle of Acts and things like that. They're more toward the hyper-dispensationalist side. Well, I believe that it's all about what took place on the cross. Because that's where Jesus said it is finished. So we go to Ephesians chapter 2. And if you want to argue about when did the church start, I think this stops the argument. I think this settles the argument. Right. This is when the church started. Now, we can discuss when were people in it. Some people, well, let me just say it this way. Um, the majority of your denominations that claim to be Christians, they think that the church starts in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. So they say the church starts at Pentecost. Well, that's after the cross, yeah. right? So that's way later. Now, maybe no one was in it till Pentecost, but when did it actually start? Well, here's what we're going to look at in the Bible, and I'm going to show you what the Bible says here. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 16. Ephesians 2, 11, Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Whew. That's what people that were Gentiles were before Jesus yeah. came, because you had to convert to Judaism in order to find God. You had to. You had to get circumcised. But now look at verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. Okay. Even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Now verse 16 is key. And that he might reconcile both, both Jew and Gentile, into one body by the cross. Hmm. You see that? Yeah. Having slain the enemy thereof. So a body beginning at the cross. It's by the cross. What, it's not the cross. Two pieces of wood don't save us, okay? No. But it's what took place on the cross. Right. So by what took place on the cross, the death of the testator, <laughs> the church is started. So I see the church starting by the cross. <laughs> Amen. So I say, when does the church start? At the cross. Because it's what he did. And it talks about a, a body and a new man. See, Jesus is the bridegroom who died for his bride. Right. So the church is the bride of Christ. So it's through, so I guess, what is that teaching us? That marriage is a death? <laughs> you get married and say, like, oh, great, now I'm dead. No, for the rest of my life. No, but he died for his bride. And the church is the bride of Christ. And I can yeah. show you those verses. So I really believe that it's through the cross that we start the church. Okay? Now, some people don't like that. Some people don't agree with that. But I believe that's what the Bible says. Do you see that too? Do you yeah. see that? Right. All right, now let's go to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. I want you to see that because that's what we believe. And we believe that because the Bible says it, all right? Not because our denomination says it. By the way, we're getting into this teaching of church history, and I can't wait to go through church history. But I don't know how long to make this or how short to make this, because I actually have 15 one-hour uh, lessons in Spanish when I taught in the Bible Institute. Actually, twice I've taught in two different Bible Institutes on this subject of church history. I don't want to go 15 Sundays, okay? <laughs> so I'll make it shorter. I'll make it I don't know. But I'll do the best that I can because I want you to see true Bible believers throughout all of the church age. I want you to see that. And uh, like we said on our one, why I'm a Baptist, right? I showed you the book, Why We're a Baptist, because the Baptists have been the ones that have been closest to the church, or uh, to the beliefs of the early church. Uh, there's actually an independent Baptist flag. And here it is. And right here on it says the blood, the book, and the blessed hope. So I'll, uh, I'll put that up here. So as we are looking at the history of the church, we want to see what the Bible says and what it is. And by the way, I'm a Bible-believing Baptist. There are some Baptists who depart from the Bible, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stick with the Bible, I mean, because I want to go by what the Bible says. Um, also, through the course of this study, I want to show you many good reference books about church history that you can read and study for yourself. So from time to time, I'll be bringing some. There's a good one called Fox's Book of Martyrs. I would recommend you to get this and read it 
as it has a lot of good information about the church. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs for, wow, it really go, gives a lot of true history of all those who suffered for their faith. So important. All right, so it's so very important that we understand what the church is and as Bible believers that the church was started by Jesus Christ. I want to make sure that we realize that the church is the body of Christ. It starts here with the death of Jesus Christ. And that is all those who are saved after he dies. Remember, it's those who are saved after he dies that make up the church, the body of Christ. The body of Christ. Before he dies, though, in the Old Testament, remember, before he dies, all that is Old Testament. And then after is the church, and it goes until the rapture. And so that's it's important to understand. Before the cross, there was a called out assembly. Now, I want to say this, but before the cross, there was also a called out assembly. Remember the definition of the word. It means a called out assembly. And the church is just that. But there is also a called out assembly before the cross. And I want you to see this as well. God's always had his people. God called out Israel as a nation before the cross, before he died. So let me show you that. Let's go to Acts chapter 7 and verse 38. It says, This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the mount Sinai. And with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. So God called Moses for a purpose and a plan which was to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. And Moses was called to lead them out. Then they were also called out of Egypt. And God called them out as a nation. And they are called a church. But they are not the same church as we are today. They are a different church. They are a church in the Old Testament in the sense that they were a called out assembly back then. The sound is bad again. All right, we'll have to go with this again. That's a bummer. Um, is it not working at all? That's awful. I don't know why it's doing that. Do you want to try another battery or not? Okay. So, <clears throat> there we go. All right, so, so according to the Bible, Israel is a called out assembly. Isn't that amazing? So let's go to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. And let's look at Exodus chapter 3 here. I'm going to show you some verses about how God said he called out Israel. Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 10. In Exodus 3.10, Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So there are called out assembly of people that God called out of Egypt. Uh, Verse 17 as well. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt into the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites into a land flowing with milk and honey. So God says, I will call you out. All right, back to Acts chapter 7, where we just were. It's called a church in Acts chapter 7 and verse 38. But go to Acts chapter 7 again and look at verse 36 and verse 40. Acts 7, 36, he brought them out. Well, to be brought out is to be a called out assembly. So he called them out for his purpose. 36, he brought them out. After that, he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. And then in verse 40, saying unto Aaron, make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses, which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we what not what has become of him. So here they are. Now go over to Acts chapter 13. We're going to be looking at a lot of scriptures today. Acts chapter 13 and verse 17. Acts 13, 17. The God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with a high arm brought he them out of it. So they're brought out. And interestingly enough, there's a time of transition. 40 years. (laughs) I think that's interesting. 40 years. A little bit of transition going on there. Interesting enough here, there's a little bit of transition going on. And we're going to look at that too. So, looking at all this, we see God called Israel out of Egypt into the land of Israel. But there was that 40 years before they got into the land. Alright, are we all together? Do you all see that? 
Then Jesus comes, who is also called out. Matthew chapter 2. Let's go to Matthew chapter 2 and verse 15. I'm going to get this all together, so stick with me. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 15. A lot of parallels between the Old Testament and the New Testament. But remember, Old Testament is not New Testament. All right? They're different. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 15. And was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. So Jesus Christ was called out. So a called out people, and then Jesus comes and he's called out, and he's calling them all out. But guess what happened? They went into apostasy. When Jesus showed up, he showed up to a faithless generation, he said. Mm -hmm. They weren't following what they were supposed to. They had turned away from God. And Rome was in charge, and they were under the discipline of the Lord. And so guess what? Jesus comes to a disobedient and gainsaying people, the Bible says. And so now he has to call out of them (laughs) some more. (laughs) There's a whole lot of calling out going on, right? And guess what he does? He calls out here in his earthly ministry. We know that earthly ministry is three and a half years. First of all, John comes, okay? And then Jesus does his earthly ministry. So this is Jesus' earthly ministry. And during that earthly ministry, he calls out 12 (coughs) disciples. And so this, back here, there's a time of transition. Here's a time of transition before it fully changes to something else. A lot of transitions going on. Now, Jesus uh, calls out his disciples. Now let's go to Luke chapter 6. And here's where I want to make sure that you realize I'm not a hyper-dispensationalist. But there's a term in the Bible that a lot of hyperdispensationalists love to use. And usually when you hear this term, you know that guy's a hyperdispensationalist. And because they use this term so much, independent Baptists won't even use this word. But it's in the Bible. So we shouldn't be afraid to use it if it's there. So go to the line, but let's don't cross that line like right. they do. You see what I'm saying? But it is in the Bible. And when Jesus is speaking to his disciples, look what he calls them in Luke chapter 6, verse 13. Luke 6, 13, all the way down to verse 16. And, uh, well, before we get to that word, all right, I'm going to hold you in suspense. It's actually two words. Um, let's look at the calling out of these people who are called the thing that I'm going to lead you up to. <laughs> look at this. This is the calling out of the twelve. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples. And of them he chose twelve, whom also he named apostles, Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zelotes, and Judas the brother of James, and Judas Iscariot, which also was the traitor. So here's the calling out of the twelve, okay? So this is Jesus calling out of those that were already called out. (laughs) So a lot of calling out going on. And here's what he calls them in Luke chapter 12, okay? Now we're going to see what they're called. And this is a term that if you hear a lot of preachers use this term, most likely they're hyper-dispensationalists because they love to use this term. And this term only shows up one time in the Bible. And it's the term called the little flock. Now in Luke chapter 12, verse 32, Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Notice that, the kingdom. So the little flock would be those that Jesus chose during his earthly ministry, and they're called the little flock. Now, you don't hear Bible believers preaching on this because they're like, I don't want to use that term because they'll think I'm one of these. But yet it's in the Bible, so there's nothing wrong with calling that the little flock. Now, what I see that hyper-dispensationalists do is they try to make the little flock go over here. Hmm. There's where we get a problem. And I've even heard some of them say, and those people are not part of the church, because what a hyperdispensationalist do? They say the church starts with Paul. Well, then why isn't it called the body of Paul? It's not. It's called the body of Christ. Yep. So I'm going to show you today that it's the body of Christ because it starts with the cross. It starts with Christ. I don't see it starting with Paul. But what they'll do is they'll take the little flock and they'll put them over here. And then they say, now they're not even part of the body of Christ. I've even heard them say, you know, Peter, James, John, they're not part of the body of Christ, the church. <clears throat> They're a different body or a different church. So see how you can go too far with this? But let's go to the line. Let's don't cross it. Let's, let's look at what the Bible says, okay? So the little flock here would be these. Now, let's look at some Bible verses because in the Bible, Jesus says to them, I am the shepherd, right? I am the good shepherd. What does a shepherd have? A flock. 
And do you know, all throughout the Old Testament, God is telling Israel, I'm your shepherd and you're my flock. There you go. <laughs> so let's look at that. Let's look at some verses. Psalms chapter 77. And yet, the flock seems to not have a good shepherd until Jesus shows up because the ones that are supposed to be in charge of Israel seem to be doing wrong. So, poor, poor sheep. You look at them as sheep, you say, oh, poor Israel, poor sheep. They don't have a shepherd that cares for them until Jesus comes. And he's the only one that does, and they kill them. They kill the shepherd that cares the most about them. That's so sad, isn't it? Oh, how sad. Psalms chapter 77, verse 20. Thou leadest thy people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Now flip over to 78.52. 78.52. But made his own people to go forth like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. Well, here they are back in Egypt. And who was guiding them in the wilderness? A pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. So Jesus was back then. But they didn't recognize that that was Jesus. And when he comes in the flesh, they don't recognize it. Isn't that sad? Right. It's so sad that Israel doesn't recognize who their Messiah is. Now let's go to Jeremiah chapter 13. And I want to get this out there. I want you to get this. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 13. So the flock in the Old Testament was Israel, was the Jews. Jeremiah thirteen seventeen. But if you will not hear it, my soul shall weep. In secret places for your pride. There was Israel's problem. They were full of pride. And mine eyes shall weep sore and run down with tears because the Lord's flock is carried away captive. And that's what happened. They were carried away captive into Babylon for their sin. But God let them come back to Israel and thank God for that. But they were still captives. To who? To Rome. Because Rome was in charge. Now flip over to Jeremiah 23. So the, the history of Israel is a history of people that just keep messing up. Just keep messing up. Just like sheep, they've gone astray. Um, 23, verse 1 through 3. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pastor, saith the Lord. And that's what happened. A lot of false prophets. Matter of fact, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they were not teaching the truth, were they? Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. You have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. And I will gather the remnant. Okay, remnant. I said it right. Amen. I'm from the south and in one of my sermons I said remnant. I just like to add extra syllables. We do that down here. But I'm going to say it right this time. The remnant. In Spanish, it's remanente. So there's more syllables in Spanish. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. So Jesus is saying, I'm going I'm to come back to them, and I'm going to let them come back to the land. And did we see that? Did we see Israel come back to their land? What a miracle. <laughs> Israel went into a, a captivity to Babylon for 70 years, and yet God brought them back. Yeah. And they denied him, and almost 2,000 years they're gone. And then he lets them come back. You think he cares about them? (coughs) Yeah. (laughs) He doesn't hate his sheep. He loves his sheep. He wants them to come back. He wants to be their shepherd. Mm -hmm. Thank God for that. Ezekiel 34 and verse 6. Ezekiel 34, 6. My sheep wandered through all the mountains upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. How sad. Mm -hmm. But look at verse 11. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep, they are scattered. So will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them uh, to their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and in all the inhabited places of the country. That's exactly what Jesus did when he fed them the 5,000. This is all prophecy. And I will feed them in a good pasture, and upon the high mountains of Israel shall their fold be. There shall they lie in a good fold, and in a fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. And I will feed my flock, and I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord God. So Jesus is saying, I'm going to come back, and I'm going to feed my flock. And that's what he does. Now, one more time, go back to Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah 23. So I want you to see this. Jeremiah chapter 23. 
Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 3 through 6. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries, whether I have driven them, and I will bring them again to their folds, and they will be fruitful and increase. This is Jeremiah 23, now verse 4. And I will set up shepherds over them, which will feed them. And they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. What did he do? He sent out his disciples. <laughs> and then verse 5, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, capital B, that's Christ, and a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. So this is prophecy of Jesus coming and eventually setting up his millennial right. kingdom. Amen. All right, are we all together now? Do we see this? So when Jesus comes... He comes to Israel, and that's his flock in the Old Testament. But then he pulls out a little flock of those of the great flock. And he says, now you guys are going to be mine that go out and feed them and preach to them and try to help them. Did they do a good job? <coughs> yeah, they did a really good job. They're out there doing miracles. They're doing all these things. A lot of people are believing in Jesus. And it's supposed to be that they believe who he is. He's the king. He's the Messiah. But... Ultimately, they reject him. So now, in the church, now we start seeing Gentiles get saved. Yeah. But this is all preparation for the church. And so this is before Jesus died, so this is to Israel. This is what the little flock was. Okay? Are you with me? Yeah. Now, Jesus' earthly ministry. Let's go to Matthew chapter 15. This is so important because what I'm teaching you today is to help you not fall into error. Right. And there is a lot of error out there, and I'm going to try to show you probably five, six different errors that people have in the church today, and it's because they're not rightly dividing this. Yep. And that's when they fall into heresy. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 24, look what Jesus says about his earthly ministry. This is Jesus' earthly ministry. Matthew 15, 24. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus says, when I came in my ministry, I'm a Jew going to Jews. Yeah. So what Jesus is speaking of in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, now John's a little bit different, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he's a Jew preaching to Jew about a kingdom message. But a lot of people today, they just want to go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and get all their doctrine. We're not over there. We're over here. Right. Now, it's not wrong to read that. It's not wrong to rightly divide that because there are some things that do apply. We can apply it. I'm going to show you an example of that. But we're not here. We're there. Yeah. All right? That's what you've got to get. A lot of people don't understand that. Go to Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 and 6. So during this dispensation, I'll just use the word, when he's dealing with the little flock, which is those called out Jews that are to the flock, Jews, because he's only Jews dealing with Jews, he tells them, do not go to the Gentiles. <laughs> look at Matthew chapter 10 and uh, look there at verse, uh, let's see, verse 6. But rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now why does he say that? Verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them saying, go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not. So Jesus' earthly ministry is a Jew to Jews, Right? Are we Jews? No. All right, so we want to be over here. So this is where we go. Now, we don't, like a hyper-dispensationalist, say, now you can't take anything of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for you. We rightly divide Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There are some things that Jesus said that we can go, okay, yeah, that can apply over here today. But there's some things he said that don't apply to today. Right. Because this is the church age, and it's an age of grace. Yes. Over here, Jesus said, if your right hand offended, he cut it off. Do we cut our right hands off today? Do we come to church with machetes and say, oh, I was bad this week, Bonk, and cut our hands off? I mean, so do you understand? A lot of churches don't understand this. They don't get this, and that's a shame. So I want you to understand that, and I know a lot of people do. Well, Jesus came preaching the kingdom message, and that's in Matthew 4.23 and Matthew 9.35. And look at John chapter 1. During this time when Jesus showed up, there was a Jewish prophecy by a Jew, Daniel, that in uh, 70 weeks, weeks of years, someone would show up. So they're looking for that someone to show up, and that someone is their Messiah. Yep. Now, they understood the Messiah as the anointed one. Well, you read your Old Testament, how'd they anoint David? They put oil on his head, and he was the king. So they're looking for a king to come and deliver them from their captors, which is Rome. So when Jesus shows up, he is coming as the promised Messiah or the king, and they're looking for that king in his kingdom. And you see that plainly in John chapter 1. 
verse 44 through 49. John 1, Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew, and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come up out of Nazareth? I don't know what Nazareth was like, but it doesn't sound like it was a great place where people wanted to go. And Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the what? King of Israel. So he says, man, you're the king. So it wasn't Elvis, it was, it was Jesus, amen? No, sorry, I didn't mean to go there. So Jesus is the king, and he's recognized as the king. So this is all about a kingdom message where a king is to come in bringing his kingdom. Yep. And that is out here. Yep. But they rejected their Messiah, so now we see the dispensation of the church age. And that's what I want to get to eventually in this is the church, the history of the church. But you see how I kind of had to show the difference between Old Testament and New Testament? I had to go over here and talk about Jesus' disciples. Now, Jesus' disciples are called disciples, but they're also called apostles. Yep. Some people try to say they're disciples here, but they're apostles over there. Actually, no. They're sent out in his earthly ministry, too, to go preach. So disciple and apostle are used interchangeably between the two. But are there apostles today? No, because apostles had signs accompanying them. And today we don't have signs. Right. And so when we get into next week, we're going to look at what they call the Great Commission. And uh, there's a lot of people that believe in the Great Commission, but they're omitting some stuff. They're really guilty of the Great Omission because part of the Great Commission is signs. And we don't do signs today. So they're taking something more for Jews and trying to force it to us today. So we've got to be careful of these things. We've got to make sure we rightly divide. So Jesus knew that he came to be the king. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 20. And he knew that they could accept him. Now, were they going to accept him was the question. He knew in his foreknowledge that they were going to kill him. He knew that. But yet he offered them the kingdom. But he knew they were going to kill him. Yep. And it says in the Bible that he knew that. Go to Matthew chapter 20, verse 17 through 19. And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples apart in the way and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him, and the third day he shall rise again. You don't think Jesus knew what was going to happen? He knew. He knew exactly that he was going to die and be buried and rise again. Um, I was going to give you John chapter 2, but I won't do that. We're doing our verse-by-verse Bible study through John, and uh, you get a chance. You'll see those real soon, how in John chapter 2, he says the same thing. Tear down my body, and and in three days it will rise again. So Matthew chapter 26, we don't have time to read there, but in Matthew chapter 26, verse 26 through 29, it's the Last Supper. And then they were scattered after Jesus was taken. We just read some Old Testament where they were scattered. (laughs) I mean, it's all there. It's all prophesied of what Jesus went through. All the Old Testament is prophecies of Jesus. All right, but that's still not the church. Now, quickly as I can, I've got to show you the difference between the local church and the body of Christ. And... Nope, can't use the back, I guess. All right, so... All right. Because there's so much to get into here, and I'm running out of room. Come away with me. Amen. Let's go rest. I'll leave that up there so you can use that after. But when we use the term church, we use it as a called out assembly. That's what the word means, right? So the church, <clears throat> there's the church as the body of believers in a specific place, and then there's the church as all safe people. And I like to call that the difference between the local church and the church triumphant. I don't even know what to call it. But the body of Christ in the Bible is everyone who's saved. And they go to heaven. So the local church is a church in a specific place. So a lot of people try to say, well, the church started with uh, Peter and the early apostles. So you have the church starting before Jesus died. Well, there was a local thing happening because there's a local called out assembly of believers 
in Christ, but they were believing he was the Messiah. They weren't trusting in his blood yet for salvation. Right. But the difference between the local church and the body of Christ. Some people say it this way. The visible church, because down here we see the believers, we're a church here. We're a local yep. organization. And others say this is the invisible church. Um, the way I like to say it is this is a organization while the other one is a spiritual organism. Yep. Now, when I get into this, I, I, I know I'm stepping on toes. I mean, like, ten different cults are going to be angry with me because of this, because I'm stepping on every one of their beliefs. A lot of even Baptists say there's no such thing as the church invisible. The local church is the body of Christ. So they refuse to believe that this is the body of Christ, all safe people. Oh, so much to get into. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 through 18. I'm going to have to close here in a second, but I just want to throw this out here because this will be important, kind of a foundation for when we get into our study next week. This is all building up to or pre-church to explain what the true church is. But what is a local church? A local church is called out assembly of people in one place. Like in the Bible, we see the church of Corinth, the church of Ephesus, the church of, you know, these places. That's a body of believers in one place. How many churches does Jesus have? One church. That's this church. That's right. But there are many local churches. And the church is the body of Christ. Yep. All right? If the church is this, then Jesus has a lot of brides. So what is he, a Mormon? <laughs> he has a lot of... So do you see the difference between the local church and the church being all safe people? So the local church is all in one place. And in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, Jesus is talking. In Matthew 16, 13, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now the Catholic Church says we're the only church, and we started with Peter, because he said upon Peter he'll build his church. Do you see the word this? If it had been Peter, it would have said that, or you. He said, this rock. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, it says Jesus is the rock. Yep. So here's what Jesus is saying. Thou art Peter, but upon this, me, Jesus, yep. rock, I'll build my church. Amen. So the church is built with Jesus Christ, okay? But before he died, he called himself out of an assembly in a local place of local visible people together. So I would call this the local church. After he died, all people that get saved through the Holy Spirit are baptized into the body of Christ, mm -hmm. which is this. Yep. So I want you to see the difference. Why do I go there? There's a uh, thing called the Baptist Briders. Mm -hmm. And what they believe is, we do not believe in this. Oh, okay, why? Why don't you believe in that? They say, we only believe in the local church. There's no invisible church. And you say, well, no, no, wait a minute. The Bible says that, and they say, well, show me it in the Bible. And you go, okay, I'd love to. <laughs> Can I show you that? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. Right. They say, where is the body of Christ? Where's all saved people already out in, in, in one place? Well, that's right here in Ephesians chapter 2. So we are not what we call Baptist brighters. No. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6. And I'm in Philippians. Uh, Ephesians 2, 6. Notice what it says. And hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. <laughs> somehow, I'm down here talking to you, and somehow I'm up in heaven sitting down. That's what the Bible says. So the called out assembly is once everyone gets saved, because God's outside of eternity, that when you get saved, we believe in eternal security. As soon as you get saved, you're sitting up there in heaven in a seat. Because it's eternal life. And God's in eternity. So God looks down and goes, oh, he got saved. You don't one day, oh, you lost it. Oh, he's not sitting here anymore. That's not how it works. Once saved, always saved. Isn't that amazing? So I just wanted you to get a, a difference. Do you understand the difference between the, the local church and the body of Christ? This is a local church. This is a body of believers. We see this. 
But the Bible talks about the church being everyone who's saved, born again. Right. And that's what we don't see because they're all over the world. And they're already up in heaven. Yeah. So, a lot more that I could get into. I'm trying to get this as quickly as I can. But I wanted to show all this because I believe this is important now. One of the reasons why a lot of guys are against the invisible church is because the term Catholic. When the church started here in the early part of the church, they called themselves Catholics because that means universal. And for the first couple hundred years, they say we are the universal church. So over here, they call themselves the universal church. And that was just the word Catholic. Well, you know what? I don't like the word Catholic. <laughs> so I don't use Catholic. I don't use that term. So I don't use the term universal or Catholic because I don't want people to get confused and think I'm an ecumenicalist and I'm a Catholic. But I also want people to know I believe the body of Christ is all safe people. And when I talk about the church, I'm not just talking about this right. like some people do. Now, there's a lot of things that I got into today. I hope I didn't get too much. I probably bit off more than I could chew. But I want you to remember these things, and this is what I want you to get a hold of. Israel is not the body of Christ. Right. There are people that believe in what they call replacement theology. And they teach that all the promises here are for us today, and that God is done with these people. No, that's what the rapture is for, to take us out so that God can go back then to dealing with the Jews here. So God's not done with them. So that's a heresy we have to expose and not believe in is replacement theology. Right. We believe that God goes back to the Jews after the rapture. Yep. So this is a time period for us to get saved into the body of Christ. Another thing we have to understand is the postponement theory. And that is a true thing. It's not just a theory, it's fact. That the kingdom here, which they could have had if they accepted Jesus, was postponed to out right. here yep. because they rejected Jesus. And there's a lot of people that say, no, they don't believe that. Now, also, the difference between the local church and the invisible church. I want you to understand that because, like I said, Baptist writers believe that only the local church is the body of Christ. So Jesus Christ has many bodies and many brides. That's just, we can't believe that. You know you met one of those when they talk about alien baptism. That's their favorite saying. Well, also, you have your hyper-dispensationalists. Don't go there. A lot of times you can identify them because they love to use the little term, little flock. But they're not wrong in, in who they're talking about if they're there. But if they make it go over here, now we've got a problem. And I guess next week we'll have to talk more about that. So I'm all over the place, but I'm trying to warn you. The, uh, a lot of your Baptist writers, too, they'll do this. You ask a Baptist writer, when did the church start? They said, I'm a Baptist, bless God, and we started with John the Baptist. <laughs> and you just kind of go, no. But do you see why they say that? They believe that the called out assembly is only on the earth. Mm -hmm. But over here, it's everybody called out of the earth like they were called out of Egypt because when we're saved, we're already seated in right. heavenly places with him. Amen. So we've got all these different heresies that we've got to um, talk about and, and make sure that we understand. So I had a lot more verses I wanted to get into. I just don't have time. So maybe next time we'll look at that. But there are many, many verses that prove that the church starts with Christ. Amen. And so you can say that the little flock in a way is still here, but they're no longer the little flock. Now they're part of the body of Christ because with Jesus, that's when it starts. And let me just go to one or two verses here real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, we run into these people all the time that, that we would call hyper dispensationists. Now let me say this. I'm not attacking them and I'm not putting them down. And I don't hate them. A lot of them love the Lord Jesus Christ and are saved people because they trust the blood atonement. And they preach the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, and they preach the blood. So I look at them as brothers in Christ. But they only want to argue. I don't. So if we disagree, we can agree to disagree. So why does there have to be a contention? Well, a lot of times for them, it's unless you believe it like I do, we can't get along. Okay, then bye-bye. You go do your church, we'll do our church, okay? But um, it's, it, it's sad to see people want to argue. But all the time I run into them, and this is what they say. Oh, Breaker, you got it wrong. The church, the body of Christ, starts with Paul. And they say, the little flock over here, they're not saved. So Peter, James, John, all these guys, they're not part of the body of Christ. I don't see that. No. I see the body of Christ starting with Jesus, and then they're in it after the cross. They just don't know anything about it, and it's revealed to Paul what it is. And they're like, oh, duh, one body. Jew and Gentile, okay, and then they understand through Paul, oh, we're all in one body. 
So that's what I see. And there's so many verses that proves that. But 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles. <laughs> should, I, should I read any longer? <laughs> so these early apostles are in the church. Because it says first apostles, right? You the wrong verse on that. Uh, 1 Corinthians, um, yeah, I'm in chapter, what do I want? 1 Corinthians 12, 27, did I read the wrong verse? Um, yeah, I read 28. Let me read verse 27. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And then verse 28. And God had set some in the church first apostles. So many other places I wanted to go, I just don't have time. Let me just close with this one, all right? Um, I have a video on YouTube, Why I'm Not a Hyper Dispensationalist. And you can go there and learn more about that. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 10, most of your hyper dispensationalists go to this verse and they say, nope, this verse says that the body of Christ, the church, starts with Paul. That's what they say. No, I'm saying that the body of Christ starts with Jesus. Yeah, amen. But they say, no, no, this verse right here, 1 Corinthians 3.10, says the body of Christ starts with Paul. Okay, let's read it. 1 Corinthians 3.10. 1 Corinthians 3.10 says, According to the grace of God which is given unto me, who's speaking, Paul, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. And they stop right there. Now, why do you stop right there? That's convenient, isn't it? They stop right there, and they say, Paul says, I'm the foundation. I'm the master builder. I started the body of Christ. Why do you not read the next verse? Right. I honestly do not understand how anyone could be a hyper dispensationalist and say that the body of Christ starts with Paul if you just simply read the next verse. Look at what it says, verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. How can you say the body of Christ starts with Paul if the Bible says the foundation of the body of Christ is Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ? Right. Now I have so many other verses I wanted to get into, but we need to stop. So maybe next time we'll look at some of that more. But I want to start next time from here on because this is the history of the church. But did you see how I had to explain this a little bit? Because some people (laughs) ironically say the church starts with John. So they got the church starting before Jesus dies. Others say, no, it starts with Peter. Um, Or others say it starts in Jesus' earthly ministry. Well, that's, that's a local called out assembly. But in the Bible, the church is the body of Christ, which is all that are saved through believing. And it's all based upon this right here. Okay? Any questions? Anybody have any questions? I know I was all over the place, but do you all understand? Any questions? I guess we'll stop there. I hope that was a blessing. I I hope. And uh, nothing like clarifying what we believe. Amen? Nothing like clarifying. Okay, we'll stop there. Thank you so much. God bless you. Amen.